Everybody, <clears throat> what a great joy to see you here to study the book of Deuteronomy together. What an amazing time I believe we're going to have, not just today, but I believe we're going to have an amazing autumn towards the end of this year as we study God's Word. This book of Deuteronomy is one of the more neglected books of the Bible for many Christians. I spoke to a Christian the other day who was surprised that we were studying the book of Deuteronomy because they said, isn't it just full of those boring laws? <laughs> this, I have to tell you, is a good-hearted Christian who just needed to think a bit differently about God's Word. All of God's Word, all of God's Word not only instructs us, but teaches us about God's heart. And we're going to get some insights into God's heart, the way he thinks, the way he feels about his people, the dreams he has for his people, and the impact that he believes his people can have, not just 2,000, 3,000 years ago, but the same principles and the same God act today in us to be his people for this world today and to make an eternal difference. Deuteronomy could be summed up by that phrase, those two words, choose life, as they're called to do towards the end of the book. Deuteronomy 30, verses 19 and 20. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life. And he will give you many years in the land he swore to give your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God's words aren't just important words. They are our life. God isn't just someone that we pray to. He is our life. And as we study Deuteronomy, I believe that we will see more and more of this life more clearly. In many ways, the book of Deuteronomy is a hinge. Genesis to Kings is really one huge story from Egypt to Cana to Babylon. And Deuteronomy stands at the end of the Pentateuch and at the start of what you would call the Deuteronomic history. The Deuteronomic history is the story of Israel from Joshua to the exile. And we get valuable insights as to what happened in that period by looking at it through the eyes of Deuteronomy. We understand better Israel's past and we understand better Israel's future. And in understanding those things, we understand how to think about our past better and how to think about our future better. But more on that eh, later on today. Not only is... Deuteronomy, a hinge, in many ways, it's also a prism. It shows us, by having a close look at God through the book of Deuteronomy, it shows us about the significance of obedience motivated by gratitude. Obedience motivated by gratitude and love that ultimately leads to great joy. And we're going to talk more about joy later on. It's amazing that a book which contains so many laws has such an emphasis on rejoicing. But we'll come to that. The verb to be happy or to rejoice is used just as frequently in the book of Deuteronomy as it is in the book of Psalms. Holding to God's commands, holding to his laws, holding to him is meant to produce joy in us. God's desire is for joy through obedience. And we know that's true. As Christians, aren't we most joyful? Aren't we most fulfilled when we are most obedient? Somehow there's, there's something that God built into us that means that when we're obeying him, then we are also close to him and then we are filled with joy. We'll see that more and more as we look at this book today. The schedule for today is that we will have three uh, sections. First of all, we're going to be talking about the details of Deuteronomy, and then in our second session, 
about choosing to learn. You know, uh, whether we learn or not is a choice in the Christian life. You can sit in a pew or on a chair, plastic or otherwise, in many meetings for many decades as a Christian. But simply sitting in those chairs and attending those meetings does not guarantee that we learn anything. There's a certain attitude of mind and heart that determines whether we learn from not only church meetings, but whether we learn from what God is doing in our lives. God is always active in my life. He's always active in your life, whether it looks like it or not, whether it feels like it or not. The only question is, are we learning? Learning is a choice. And we're going to be talking about that in our second session, particularly looking at the past. And then our third and final session is about choosing to trust thinking about the future. Will we trust God for what's going on in our lives right now? Will we trust God for our future, for our church's future, for our children's future? Will we trust Him? And that was a central question of Deuteronomy that God was posing to the Israelites. I have been with you up till now. I have taken you to this place. Will you trust me for the future? It's a question for us too. For just being here does not mean we trust God. It means we thought it might be interesting to come here today. That's about as much as it can mean. Do we trust God? We'll talk about that in our final session. Should we dig into our first session on Deuteronomy details? Let's talk about some Deuteronomy details today. I'm going to run through these fairly quickly because uh, you can look up most of this information on Wikipedia where it may or may not be accurate. You have to, you have to decide. <laughs> First of all, who wrote Deuteronomy? I would say Moses and his friends. You say, well, I sure, thought, surely it must have been all written by, by Moses. Well, we do know that uh, he did write uh, a good amount of it. And uh, we have some, I have some scriptures for you there. By the way, I think every scripture I will put on the screen is on your handout. So if you don't, don't, don't try and write all the scriptures down, you might want to write notes. That's why they're all there. I think every single one is on your handout. If you didn't get a handout, uh, if you have a mobile device and you go to nwlcc.org, the handout is up on that website and you can download it onto your mobile device even as we speak, as long as it doesn't get you distracted from the lesson. Um, chapter 31, verse 9, Moses wrote down this law and gave it to the Levitical priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Chapter 31, verse 22, so Moses wrote down this song that day and taught it to the Israelites. See, Moses was a song leader. Come on, the song leaders. You stand in the line of Moses. Chapter 31, verse 24. After Moses finished writing in a book the words of this law from beginning to end, he gave this command to the Levites. So, yes, he wrote. Uh, Jesus, of course, quotes Moses, quotes Deuteronomy as the words of Moses which you can look up. However, we also have uh, this incident uh, where it says, Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there on Moab, as the Lord had said, verse th chapter 34, verse 5. I think it would have been a little tricky for Moses <laughs> to, to write that particular uh, section there. And there are the, the most radically conservative scholars say that Moses knew what was going to happen and wrote it down as if it had already happened. And I, I think that's just playing, that's a little bit too contrived for me. I, I think he had some friends like Joshua, who we also know wrote a lot of things from the book of Josh Joshua, uh, that uh, wrote down some of those uh, little extra bits. Uh, the text is inspired, not the author as such. Right? It's God's word that's inspired. And the fact that Moses wrote most of it, I think, uh, lends a lot of credibility to it, but it's not the key issue as to whether it is God's word to us today. Um, uh, when was it written? Uh, different uh, people placed the Exodus at different times, but the most commonly held view is that 1400 or thereabouts is uh, are, are, are what's happening here in Deuteronomy. Um, on a timeline, which is a little, uh, I think you can see that up there. On a timeline we have here, I can't even see it myself. Who's got better eyes than me? I need to look at my slide here more clearly. Okay, so uh, at the end of that red line there, then you've, that's when Jacob is going to Egypt and around 1880. Um, and then you have a long gap while the Israelites are in Egypt. 
and they start to be oppressed, we think, around 1720. They're a kind of okay there as a, as a group, as a tribe, until about that time. That's when the oppression begins, and it carries on for many, many years, up until about 14, just before 1480, 1490. Moses flees Egypt after killing the Egyptian, and then we have the Exodus uh, somewhere around this time here. So you can see, look at this uh, length of time that the Israelites were in Egypt, first as a family or small tribe of people, a, a clan really, and then coming to be a very populous group here. That's a very, very long time. They had been waiting for God to do something amazing for a very long time. And of course we know, we'll talk more about this later, once they got out of Egypt, um, that was a great success. Then they traveled to Kadesh Barnea, which we'll talk about later. And once they got there, uh, they were supposed to go into the promised land. And you know what happened then when the spies came back and everybody was skeptical except for the two spies. And, and then they, they, they rejected God's command and then they were made to wander in the desert for 40 years. Can you imagine? You've been oppressed or you've been in another nation. You haven't been a nation for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And you finally get out. And then you think, great. And God has promised us, <coughs> excuse me, God has promised us this land of Canaan. We're finally going to have, we've got our own identity. We've got our own God. We've got our own leaders. And now we're going to have, have our own home. And then you have to wait another 40 years. I think it's a little bit like countries that have been uh, conquered uh, by an imperialist uh, power like the British uh, or something like that. And, and then you get your independence, and as soon as you get your independence, you get another dictator, and you don't really have freedom. Perhaps a bit like, uh, um, uh, a bit like Burma or some of the ex-communist countries or maybe Zimbabwe. You think it's going to be great now, but mm, then it doesn't turn out to be quite as how much it must have broken the hearts of the people that went through that. Anyway, more on that later. That's roughly the time that we're dealing with. Where, was, where are the incidents recorded here in terms of happening at the time? It refers back to many other incidents in the book of Deuteronomy. We'll talk about that. But at the time of Moses speaking these words, where are they? They're on the east bank of the Jordan. They are roughly near that place, Heshbon, just about where the eye is of Jericho. Um, that's roughly where all this is happening. Um, a little bit of a zoom in there, and we're talking about Beth Peor comes up many times, and that's where a lot of this is being spoken. Um, it looks a bit like this today. If you were looking from uh, the, the viewpoint of where most of this is happening across the Jordan to the Promised Land, that's the view you would have today, and I don't think that view has changed very much. Uh, maybe not so many telephone wires and uh, uh, television aerials and houses, but nonetheless, the same landscape is what they would have seen uh, all those three, three and a half thousand years ago. So they could see the promised land. I mean, all of this is being spoken of while they are gazing. I wonder sometimes if Moses is speaking and they're not really looking at Moses, they're just looking, ah, there it is. There it is. Oh. You know, it's like that at a wedding when, you know, the bride and groom, they're, they're here and there's a hundred people, but they only see each other. You know, it's, you can be speaking to them, but you're not connecting. And that, I think that's kind of what's happening. That's where they are. Um, it talks in chapter 34 about Moses, of course, going up to the mountain when God tells him, uh, you can see the land, but you're not going to cross over. Uh, he talks about the, the Pisgah, which is here, uh, which is 790 meters in height, 2,660 feet in old currency, um, giving you a different view. It talks about how Moses is able to see the whole area and down as far as Zoar, it mentions. And this is a 3D uh, kind of expose. So the, he's standing about here, and he can see all the way down this valley. Zoar is about here. He can see that far, and you can still see that far today. It's a, you can see a very, very long way. That's a different view from the north looking south. So this is the north end. That's the south end. Moses is standing somewhere around here, looking across at the promised land, but also looking back. And he can look back and think about what God has done in bringing them to this place at this time. It also mentions the place as being Mount Nebo, which looks like that. And Pisgah today looks like this. And that's a spot where they think Moses might have stood. They don't know for sure, 
I think he might have stood there and looked across, and of course it would be clearer uh, uh, on, if, if the picture was a little clearer, you'd see. But it's, you can look all the way across to the promised land. So this is where these events are taking place. Now, perhaps more significantly, what we should ask ourselves is why? Why is this happening? Why do we have this book? What was it written for? What is its purpose? I would suggest there are two main ones. There are many. We could have a week on all the different purposes of the book of Deuteronomy, but I would suggest that two in particular uh, should be focused upon. The first is this, that the Israelites were called to be a witness to the nations a witness to the nations. In chapter 4, verses 5 to 8, See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? These laws were meant to be lived out in such a way that the nations would notice Not only would they notice, they would admire. These people have wisdom. These people have understanding. These people are a great nation. That wasn't meant to just fill the Israelites with a great sense of self-importance. What that was meant to do was to point to God as being where all that comes from. And so an Israelite could say, thank you for acknowledging that we are a great nation, but let me just let you know how it is that we have this wisdom and how it is that we have this understanding. I need to tell you about our great God. Isn't that the same for us? When we hold to God's teachings, our lives change. We change. And people notice. And we pray that they will notice that rather than our religiosity, our self-righteousness, or our hypocrisy. We pray that they'll understand that we are weak vessels. Amen. But we also pray that the fruit of our lives will show us to be wise and understanding and connected to God. They were meant to be a witness, and so are we. A good passage for uh, that for us would be, for example, John 13, right? The love we have for one another means that by this everyone will know you are my disciples. The reason we're consistent in coming to church, the reason we're consistent at our discipling times, the reason we're consistent at coming to our family group and we are devoted to those things isn't to tick a register, isn't to say that we turned up. It's so that we have deep, loving relationships. I can't have a deep, loving relationship with someone I see once a month. Neither can you, neither can anybody. If we don't have that consistency, we cannot have the depth. If we don't have the depth, we don't have the love. If we don't have the love, no one's going to notice. And that's why we do these things. Matthew 5, in the same way, Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Our good deeds are meant to glorify God, not make us feel better. There's a big difference between those things. What about 1 Peter chapter uh, 4? 1 Peter 4, you spend enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry, they are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. It's actually a good sign if non-Christians heap abuse on you. Now, let's hope it's for the right reason. (laughs) But it should surprise our old friends that we don't continue with the lifestyle we had before. It should surprise our family that we don't, to the point where they're like, you're crazy, you're stupid, you're an idiot, are the kind of things we don't like to hear, but are the kind of things we should be hearing from people who knew us in our non-Christian days. Something's wrong with you. should be something that is said to us. We need to be a witness by the change of our lifestyle. Our repentance needs to confuse people. 
Not only are we a witness, and they were called to be a witness, but we're also called to inherit some good things from God, as indeed the, Jew, the Israelites were as well. In chapter 32, verses 44 to 47, Moses came with Joshua, son of Nun, and spoke all the words of this song in the hearing of the people. Then when Moses finished reciting all these words to all Israel, he said to them, Take to heart all the words I have solemnly declared to you this day, so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. They are not just idle words for you. They are your life. By them, you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. They're going to possess something. They're about to inherit something. They're about to get something that God has planned and prepared for them for centuries. He's had this in mind since the beginning. They're going to get it. They're going to have it. We have so many promises. We have so many things that we are designed by God to inherit. It's going to come because we don't treat God's words idly. I mean, it is a delight for me personally. I'm so encouraged to see so many here today and see all of you here with your Bible and your notepad and whatever. And, and I mean, I, I, love, I love teaching this stuff. I love teaching it in itself. But the, honestly, there's nothing like teaching it to a group like this who are eager to learn and eager to absorb it and take it away and, and, and practice it and, and interpret it into your own life. I mean, it's so wonderful to see that. It's so important that we don't treat these words idly. We don't open our Bible and like, well, I read a bit today. Amen. It's, it's meant to change us and, and, and do something inside us that only God can do, right? That's important that this yeast goes through the whole church. I know some can't be here today, and we understand that, and if they can catch up on the tapes and all that. But there are some, perhaps, in some of our family groups who could be here. But there's something not quite right in the way they're thinking about the significance of the Word of God. It's not about attending a meeting. You understand what I mean. It's about an eagerness. It's about an eagerness to say, who's teaching the, the Word of God is being taught? Let me be there. I mean, I remember as a young Christian. Some of you remember as a young Christian. I mean, I remember. I, I just wanted to know. I mean, some of us, we used to go to extra meetings. No one, you know, just, just to find somebody else teaching the Bible. We, we go to our normal Bible discussion, family group thing. We, we go to midweek. We go on a Sunday. And then we try and sneak into leaders' meetings. There were a number of us as young Christians because they used to close the doors at leaders' meetings. I mean, they, they clo- I went down to uh, Lambeth North Mission. And, and if you were there before, it was at 7.30, the leaders' meeting, or 7. I forget. But you'd, I'd be in there in the lobby. The lobby would be crammed full of people who'd all arrived early just in case we could sneak into the leaders meeting and you'd see them all there in the leaders meeting and your nose up against the glass like why can't I come in and I don't know why that was but nonetheless there was a no one explained it I actually don't know but it doesn't the point is we were all in this little lobby area trying to get in we wanted more teaching as much as we can possibly get so encouraging to see the teenagers here it's great to see you here. As Andrew mentioned earlier, because I think, I know you've got studies to study. You've got some GCSEs. You've got some A-levels. You've got some degree stuff to do. Amen. I, do all that and do a good job, okay? But I, I am encouraged that you would prioritize the Word of God. Never lose that. It's through treating God's words with respect and honor and eagerness that we inherit the promises that God has in mind for us. And they, the Israelites, were promised that if... They held to God's word with respect. It reminds me of this passage in the New Testament. Uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exile scattered through many places, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ! Exclamation mark. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice. Though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your, uh, so that these have come so that the, the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, 
glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's a, that's, that's a passage of Scripture that deserves to be set to music. Some great stirring piece of music someone needs to write. I mean, what an incredible promise we have. What an amazing inheritance that is available to us. Even better than the inheritance available to the Israelites. Never perish, spoil, or fade. The theme of inheritance is very important in Deuteronomy, and it is very important to our faith and our growth in our Christian life. So we've looked today at some of the, in the first session, at some of the details of Deuteronomy. And in particular, we focused at the end here on the fact that God's people in Deuteronomy and God's people today are called to be a witness, that the practice of God's teachings makes us look a little strange and different, but it tells people that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Also, that God has good things in store for us. If we treat his words with respect, if we obey his commands, then there is an inheritance available to us even more glorious than that available to the Israelites. This ends our first session. We're going to come back in, a few, in 10 minutes and talk about choosing to learn by learning from the past. Let's take a 10-minute break. Thank you very much.